Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes tonight. My name is Tim. My apologies, I'm just getting over a little bit of a cold. But uh, most of you guys already know the rules. We start off with a brief announcements period. We then go into our speaker. Then we have a question and answer period with our speaker. And then we have the infamous rebuttal period. Since uh, Brom has already collected money, we'll just go straight into our announcements period. And tonight our speaker is going to be uh, our infamous college collegial host, Charlie Paydock. All right, let's get rolling. Yes. Right. Without any further ado, we will uh, hear from Professor All right. Charles Bidock. Right. All right, good to be in here. Uh, we're going we're gonna to get through many facets of the American Revolution. Uh, I'm going to tr try to maintain some continuity in terms of the sequence of the events, but it's difficult. Uh, and it's going to be hard. I'm going to move pretty quickly, but it's hard to encapsulate uh, probably 20 or 25 years of events in a little while here. Uh, but uh, it's a jumbled assortment of events uh, that finally resulted in what we call the United States. But anyhow, we'll have some fun here, and I hopefully you'll learn from this. Uh, I came across this, and by the way, if I fail to speak in this, let me know. Uh, this historian put together the entire revolution on a tree, and uh, one of the things that's rather intriguing about the American Revolution is that more of it from my perspective, took place before the actual war. And it's quite legitimate to have the roots here yes, and things of this nature, as we'll see later. Uh, about two thirds of what I would say the history of this event took place before the actual event, the preliminary circumstances here. But let's begin. Quit blocking Williamsburg, Charlie. I thought we'd begin with a little pipe and drum music from Williamsburg, Virginia. And if you're not aware of this, it's uh, an authentic, to every extent, uh, recreation of the time period. If you ever have occasion and want to do something historical, I cannot more than recommend going there. I've been a member of the Williamsburg Foundation for many, many years. By the way, these tunes, um, the pipe and drum tunes, were used in the British military during the course of the day. And they would summon certain things like assembly and uh, uh, mess and things of that nature. Uh, they weren't just for entertainment purposes. Uh, but where do we begin with the, the, the American Revolution actually begins in another war. And that's the French and Indian War in Europe was known as the Seven Years War. Uh, there is a documentary out that's entitled about this event called The War That Made American, and it, and it really did. Uh, what you're looking at here are some of the Hudson River Valley paid School of Paintings, which are popular. Actually, if you go to the New York Historical Society, they have an enormous collection of these. And uh, forming the background, background of the events here. Um, the, one of the things I should, I'm going to include a lot of artworks in this. That was my primary reason for putting a lot of, a lot of these together. And uh, one of the things that's amazing about these is that the artists would go out there and maybe do some sketches, but none of these were painted actually on site. They might even have been painted several years after the artists had visited the locale. But it's, that, the main focus of this 
conflict was in fact the upper New York area there. Um, one of the things about the French and Indian War, the British thought it was fought largely on behalf of the Americans. And it was a very expensive war. They actually outspent the French. And it left the British government in debt to about the tune of about 60 million pounds. And their annual budget, for comparison, was only 8 million. So you can see, they wanted, they were in debt. Um, let's see. Now we're getting into, there were four, four entities that comprised the American Revolution. The French, certainly the British, the Colonials, and the Indians. Uh, the French never took settlement of North America very seriously. I think the, they were outnumbered about 18 to 1 uh, by the Amer British colonists. So they never, they thought, they thought it, like Canada, they said it was a few acres of snow. Um, let's see, now the Indians were the other players in this, in particular the Iroquois League. Now, when it, there's things that, one thing as the war began, there's one thing they realized. They had to take sides in this one way or another. And they weren't too happy about the colonists, whether they were British or Americans or whatever. But the one thing that undermined it was that they thought they could trust the British not to take away their lands, where it was just the opposite for the uh, American colonials. And one Indian, though, he got a little fed up with the British and the French, like in the French. He said, well, the British say they only want the land on one side of the river, and the French say they only want the land on the other side of the river. Leaving them with the river. They certainly were foreboding characters if you encountered one. Uh, they did, they liked to cover themselves. And when they talk about war fate, they certainly were fearsome lot. They, this guy right here is carrying a brown vest, which is the standard weapon of the time. It's about 69 caliber. It was, it was a fearsome weapon. Uh, rarely, rarely, if ever. It had almost no accuracy, fortunately. Um, this is where we see this guy first shows up. George Washington. And the war was fought about what was called the Forks, or Fort Pitt. Pittsburgh. Uh, he actually had the distinction of starting this war. Uh, he went as an envoy. I didn't understand this. He was sent by the British to Pittsburgh and told the French, this is our territory, the Ohio country, they called it. And he said, this is, this is British territory. You're going to have to leave. And they said, no. <laughs> like, you know, you know, you got a guy shows up and says you're going to have to leave, you know. I don't understand this. He said, no, we don't feel like it, you know. And um, anyhow, he ended up killing a, a French envoy. And he even had, he set up a fort. He, it was a, this guy was a disaster from the get go. He built a fort that it took the French like about half an hour to take. Yeah, he surrendered, and that's where he had him. Then they made him surrender, and it was in French, and he admitted to all his wrongdoing and so forth, and he said, oh, I didn't know what I was signing. He actually wrote a story about his adventures, oddly enough, but he was a disaster. Uh, he didn't have an auspicious beginning to his career in the military. He really didn't want to be a soldier, though. And there's no doubt about that. He also went on, not only did he start the war, but he also, actually, he was something of a hero. The British marched into uh, the area uh, with 1,500 soldiers, and they were going to take Pittsburgh. And this is, there's a lot of things, people always ask me about Indian fighting. And this is where Indian fighting took place. And to give you how it happened was the British were marching and the French only had 72 soldiers. And they held up the column. In the meantime, the Indians took apart the British. It was a, it was a major disaster in the British military. They lost about 1,500 soldiers. And, but, Washington was something, came out of this as a hero. If you see, this is him here 
he actually assumed command. And actually, he, he, he got like, there was a legend, like he, he was invincible even, because there were like bullet holes in his coat, like four bullet holes and things, but he came out of it as a hero with some reputation. So uh, he did emerge from that. Uh, some of the background of this, this is not politically correct, obviously. And one of my favorite authors, James Fenimore Cooper, uh, and it's been, of course, made into movies. One other movie, this is actually about the Revolutionary War, but I, I'm amazed at this one. They got guys up here fighting on the name of the movie here. Right. <laughs> and then again, yeah, of course, this is, takes place actually during the war, but in that locale. I also came across this one. You could get little Indian figures if you if you do toy soldier lead stuff like this. You could get a a woodland Indian war party and things like this. Um, some other things about the Indians up there since it is the French and Indian War. I came across this in Boston, and maybe this isn't quite politically correct, but. They took the Indian, they put little clothes on him there because he couldn't be naked. Actually, these are tobacco leaves, I was told. But that's the, uh, they certainly had uh, concerns about the Indians. Uh, the image of the Indian has always been a tough one. Actually, I came across this in the National Gallery of Art, and the title of this painting is Scalp Dance. But it, even during the war, there was, we'll get into it, there was a little, there was a lot of fear about the Indian involvement, participation. Uh, I think, look at this guy, he's naked, his nakedity there, they put a little thing out on the... <laughs> Anyhow, uh, the war came to an end with the Battle of Quebec. And I like art, and I said I'm throwing in some art. Okay, the, judge, the general in charge of the French got killed, and the general in charge of the British got killed. Now, who died more, more heroically? I'll leave it up to you. Actually, this guy died two days later, later in bed, but <laughs> the artist didn't concern, that didn't concern him. But anyhow, Montcalm and Wolf, um, it comes with uh, died as a result of this. Now this is where we're going to get into the war stuff. It took a while, but we're getting there, boys and girls. Okay, now this is something never really talked about too much. But the British passed something known as the Quebec Act. And this area here was known as the Ohio Country. And in effect, they gave that over to the French colonists who lived there. And French law prevailed. Fran French was the language that was spoken. And the Catholic Church was recognized. So they kind of placated the French. And then the other part, they gave to the Indians. Now why would they do this? Because it didn't cost anything. If they had had little things differently, they would have had forts and they had to have forts and send people there to keep control and this settled everything. The only thing is the colonists had fought in the war and they thought they were so loud. And that's what I mean, this is the beginning of the war. They said, what the heck? Now they did send their militias to fight with the British. There was one other thing that happened here in these militia that fought in the French and Indian War is they showed up and they said, hey, we got no problem fighting for, you know, Mother England. The only thing is, we ain't taken orders from no British officers. They were pretty tough officers, but they laid the line down and there was a dispute about that. So you can see there was some friction in the beginning. I mean, they wanted to fight, but they weren't going to take orders from the British. They were something started to assert themselves. Uh, here and George Washington, by the way, he's here. He is again. Actually, this is considered a an authentic recreation from Mount Vernon. Uh, he began as a surveyor, um, and the guy was land hungry. It stayed his whole life. I mean, Mount Vernon, when he died, was eight thousand acres. 
And if you go around Washington, I don't even I'm amazed how big the damn place is. Um, but he liked land, and he also had claim, I think, somewhere to another forty thousand. Mm -hmm. But this really ticked off the American settlers here, the Quebec Act. Now, the other thing, it also upset the colonies because this is something now map, map not often seen. Um, but they had claims on this land. Um, the, I've often found this amazing. Virginia goes all the way to here, and then it jumps over into Wisconsin up here somehow. But it's uh, it's the, that, that southern Wisconsin, southern Michigan are disputed between Virginia and Massachusetts. Yeah, I mean, but it jumps. And then Massachusetts jumps over New York, which isn't much. <laughs> Pennsylvania just... <laughs> but I mean, there were... This upset the colonial governor. And, and so, Buffalo? you know, so... This is another thing, the land claims. Um, that's what I mean. Technically, he, that's what he goes up to Pittsburgh and says, this is Virginia, you know. Now, one other thing, this is just, and I think I could be challenged on this, but one other thing about this land stuff, being locked out of the land was, I've been there several times in Cumberland. The Cumberland Gap was discovered in, or at the same time, the same year as a matter of fact, 1763, so at this very same time, they got a way to get west. The, the authorities say, no, we're giving it to who, the French who we just bought and the Indians who we just bought. So oh, that's cool. That, <laughs> that's real popular. But anyhow, um, this is a little getting ahead of it. <coughs> Manifest Destiny uh, picture here, the bottom of the Americans extending. This is actually a picture owned by the Union Pacific Railroad in their headquarters. I've seen this. But they, that's what I mean, the Cumberland Gap was opened in 63. Now let's get back to George. What happened to poor George? Uh, this, he applied, he wanted, I told you, he wanted to be a soldier. His fourth, first portrait is him wearing a uniform. And they say, historians say, well, that's a pretty good indication of what he thought of himself. But he wanted to be an officer in the British Army. And he had been in charge of what was considered the best unit in, in the militias. They called it the Virginia Blues. And he whipped them in the shape. And still, they said, you're a colonial guy. This is the British Army. And this upset him to no end. I mean, you want to, he was the curve guy. And they wouldn't let him in the army. I mean, I think this upset him. And maybe why he showed up later on. Anyhow, he ended up marrying, it wasn't such a bad deal. Instead of going, staying in the army, he married the richest widow in Virginia. <laughs> married Augustus, or Martha. And she's described as being a little plump, which was considered attractive at the time. But I, this is the most popular picture floating around these days, where they, I guess they call this a regression. And this is an authentic picture from the National Gallery. And this is allegedly what she looked like when he was close. But she had, a, she had a lot of dough. She had money like you wouldn't believe, man. Um, anyhow, they settled down to a tranquil life. Actually, this was the original Mount Vernon. This is Mount Vernon. This was the original house. And he did pretty good. He actually added on those wings. And I've never seen this before. He used to go around the, the Mount Vernon on this. And he had a little chair put on a wagon. <laughs> it was kind of cool, you know, actually, you know. But, um, um, let's see, okay, so that, let's see. Oh, the other thing about Mount Vernon, I'll digress a little bit, that always amazed me. This is, this is the single most popular stop of school groups. This, whoops. This line of buses goes on and on around forever. There's a mile of these. 
the kids who are absorbing this this stuff at Mount Vernon, anyhow, uh, it's right in town. It's easy to get to if you get to Washington. But okay, now what do we do? Okay, the war is over. Yada yada yada. And what do we end up with? And the term that's used, the British really didn't bother the colonials. And this is called the historian salutary neglect. I mean, England never planned to have an empire. And they didn't monitor these guys too closely. Um, the only thing they were concerned about, honestly, was that they were no cost to England. And they really didn't. So as long as you didn't send them a bill, they kind of left them alone. They said, that's fine, do whatever you want. Now, there was another thing. You know, this gets later on in pool car, and you might know some of you guys are there. They regarded the parliament in England, that's the only legitimate legislature. So all you could have all these other little yada yadas and club name, nothing. The only legitimate one is this one. And actually, their colonial legislatures weren't all that active either. They had, I think, I think that the state of Massachusetts had six civil service employees. And there were many sessions where they never passed a law or anything. You know, they would kind of meet, you know. But, uh, and of course in Parliament, now you also had two divisions. This came out later in the war. They were not all on the same side. There were the Whigs. And Whig and Moon is kind of a derogatory term, but they accepted it. And the Tories, who were the Hawks. Yeah. And and the other thing is, this thing about oh no taxation with representation. They maintain that if you were in Parliament, you didn't really represent a district. You represented all Englishmen. See, <laughs> so you can buy into that if you want. Anyhow, how were the colonies doing? Okay, they're left alone. Um, they actually had one of the highest standards of living on earth. Um, nine out of ten people own land. Um, very little or no taxation. Um, the only thing that happened now was that no matter how well you did, you would never be considered like the real British. And this kind of always bothered them. You would never, you, no matter how much money you had or something, you were, they still considered the colonials kind of like oddballs or second class. And this bothered them to no end. Really it did. You couldn't get a fine carriage. If you got a carriage, it, all the horses didn't match. Or something, you know, something was wrong. The other thing that kind of bothered them, they did trade with England, we'll get into that. But they thought they were getting cheated. They would send them like cheap plastic shit from England. <laughs> they really did. There's letters from George Washington. He said, you know, the last suit you sent me was made out of pretty cheap stuff. I am going to not do business with you. And they didn't like that either. They thought they, but half the trade was with the colonies. Anyhow, everyone was doing pretty good here. Oh, this is my theory. The American Revolution began because they had a group like the College of Complexes in Philly. <laughs> Anyhow, Ben Franklin set up this club, the Junta, or actually I've also heard of it called the Club for Mutual Improvement. The working men, they met weekly. Tradesmen would debate political and economic issues such as does the importation of indentured servants increase or decrease the wealth of our country. Oh, this should be a standing crowd only. Ah. Have you lately observed any encroachment on the just liberties of the people? Yes. Yeah, yeah you're darn right. Okay, and involved in the reading society, public library, and actually most of the, actually there were about 37 of these throughout the colony. Can they get you an extra plate? Um, they, Actually, this reminds me of you guys. 
No. I said, that's it. I could. <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> that's how you guys reading it. <laughs> and in four, look at that. Oh, yeah. Go, let's go to the college drink yeah. tonight, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, this is, uh, if you want straight history, the trade. Uh, raw materials go manufactured goods coming back um, and of course the slave trade uh, molasses turned into rum so forth so it was very profitable Every, they were making money so, so they didn't want us to I just came across this in Boston um, the seafaring the, the, they were tied to the sea um, okay now, what the British did in order to pay for the war, yeah, this is, this is in Boston, so I threw this in, uh, was to pass the Navigation Act, which imposed duties um, on imported goods. And they wanted, and they needed money. And they thought this was one method of doing so. However, most of the colonialists were smugglers, <laughs> if not all. <laughs> they even had a pass what was known as writs of assistance, like martial law. To, you know, I, I mean, they did. They they bypassed this, but they were paying it. But in the navigation acts, there were a whole bunch of these, and on paint and tin and different products, enumerated products. But there was one method of raising money. Um, now the one way of raising money that really got their dander up, man this really upset them, was the Stamp Act, which we all heard at one time or another. And um, it, it even extended to odd things like if you got playing cards and dice you had to pay this tax. And they didn't like it for one reason because like the other trade tax, no big deal. They kind of went along with those. But this was an internal tax. And they didn't vote for it. And this is where you get the stuff, no taxation without representation. This was an internal tax. It was a different type. And they actually, they redesigned the stamp to do, make it look like this. And this really got things going here. Um, one other thing. This thing about no taxation, I don't know if I can, I can explain this. If you didn't, if you weren't voting in representative, the only people who didn't vote or were represented were like children or women or, you know, trouble may or whatever. It really was kind of insulting to them that they didn't, they weren't represented. That was a real issue. That you weren't, qual you didn't have the qualifications to be represented. How can I say it like that? All right. All kinds of disruption here, tarn feathering, all over, all over the place. Yeah, get them, yeah, get them out of here. This is now, we're, we'll get later in. Oh, this is a Liberty, they put up, they had Liberty Tree. Later on, the British came in and bought, they chopped it down. That's, that's what we oh. think of your tree. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, the Stamp Act was the first one that caused real disturbances. Um, these guys were wild. They even stormed the home of the governor of Massachusetts and wrecked it. I mean, it'd be like taking Quinn's house. I mean, these guys are going, wow, this is a tax, you know? I mean, they went in and trashed his house. He had to run out the back door. <laughs> you know, he was <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, this is from the Smithsonian. If you didn't have a tree, I guess they put up Liberty Tar and Feather. Here they dump water on you. But actually, these Liberty Poles, actually, it's in the book of the United States Army. There's one. You can find one. But they, they really went, you know, they were serious about this. All right, uh, let's see here. Stamp back. All right, let's see what else. Okay, wait a minute. 
Okay, we we'll, won't we'll get in. Let's see. Okay, now the other thing that came about, they had to have something like an internet those days, but they didn't, you know, obviously they didn't. So they had these committees of correspondence. Now these are the two guys, bar none, who caused the revolution in many respects. Sam Adams is one of them. And I like this, he sent letters around newspapers and he used different names so that they were, he'd fool people in their thinking. It was all kinds of people. Actually, he was something of a bum. This suit, he was sent to the Continental Congress. And they said, all right, we're gonna have to send Sam. He's the most active. But he was dressed like a bum, and they actually sent a tailor to his house to fit him with this suit. <laughs> Because they were ashamed <laughs> to represent the state, the colony. <laughs> they said, we got to get this, you know. <laughs> but he was, he was a, a real firebrand. And the other guy, now this is a real odd assortment here. The other guy who was equally his partner was um, John Hancock. John Hancock was just the opposite. He was the richest guy in the colonies. I mean, this guy had money like you wouldn't believe. Um, he actually got in trouble for smuggling. Uh, John Adams was helping him out. They, oh, they came to inspect one of his ships, and the inspector somehow got locked in the hold. And when they finally got, they said, oh, we're working on the lock, I don't know. And when they got out all this wine that they shouldn't have imported, French wine was gone, and. <laughs> you know. Oh, the one other guy that's floating around, it wasn't all New England, this guy here, Patrick Henry, and he aspired to be like a Presbyterian minister for some reason, and he came up with these speeches, oh, we're not Virginians, we're not New Yorkers, we're all Americans, and all very, you know, and... Um, he later became governor of Virginia, and here's this thing, give me liberty or give me death, you know, his declaration here. <laughs> They're applauding, yes, oh, so, okay. <laughs> Anyhow, getting back to the war, the scene of the crime, or the scene of the, all the activities begin in Boston. And this is the Boston State House. Uh, actually, kind of intriguing. There's a there's a subway stop underneath it. By the way, it makes it easy to get to. Uh, I just came. I I came across this in, this house in Boston. <laughs> this one ain't much of a house either, you know. But this one. <laughs> but it's an older city. But I thought I'd throw it in here. I gotta get moving here. One of the things interesting on the house here. I couldn't get this photo, but there you have the lion, which represents the wisdom of government and so forth. And if you come over here, this is the folly of the unicorn. So the choice is yours. You want to be, you know, an obedient citizen or some renegade, you know. And this is just around town, idealized images of the their heritage. You can find these all over. Who's that? Anybody. Any Joe, Joe Cone, you know. <laughs> okay, the British, um, as a show of force, they were getting all this trouble out of, out of Boston. And as a show of force, they sent an army. They sent 4,500 soldiers. And they occupied the town and shut down the port. Um, and needless to say, the soldiers and the locals got a little scrape. And, whoops, it ended up in the Boston Massacre. Um, which some kids were just throwing snowballs or something, and somehow a gun went off. And, um, but they turned it into, oh, this was murder. This was like British soldiers. This is terrible. And this picture, this is actually by Paul Revere. Went all over the. I love this dog here. I don't know if that's But this is all totally inaccurate. They make it look like there was an army and, you know, a gun went off, you know, and 
Actually, John Adams defended these guys and got them off. Um, but the media picked up on this. I came across this in a the museum. There's always a spin on these things. Um, anyhow, there was a battle of minds, and we're going to get into this. So, you know, there's, throughout the world, there's a battle of minds. And the colony it wrote this saying, this pamphlet, this week in the pamphlet war. And people don't realize they wrote their own regarding this taxation issue. And amazingly enough, um, there's two things about this. Even issuing this pamphlet always amazed me. It's because they thought the common people could never comprehend politics. They thought they were just too stupid. And even always amazed me on this. And actually, there's one other thing I should bring in. They were all, they ridiculed the Americans because they, they let women speak and have opinions. And they thought that was totally ridiculous. Sorry, Mr. Women listening to women on politics. Well, but, it is. You know. Anyhow, the, the British, another way of raising money was they had enormous surplus of tea and they sent these, the, the tax on tea it was like three cents a pound or something, you know, keep it. Actually, you'd have to drink tea like, like, like in a year, you'd have to drink a thousand gallons to pay anything. <laughs> and they wouldn't understand why they objected to this. <laughs> it was even cheaper. The tea was cheaper than regular tea. So it had included a tax. Big deal, you know. It was a deal, but... No, they wouldn't have anything to do with it. So they went out there and they threw 340 in Boston, 342 cases of it into the, you know, the ocean. They just said, the heck with this. Actually, one of the things that amazed, they didn't take any, I would thought they would have stolen the tea. But they caught one guy putting some tea in his pocket and they stripped them and made him go home naked. You weren't supposed to steal any of them. Actually, there were two other tea parties, by the way. There was one in Philly and one in New York that you don't hear about. But they didn't let them land. They, they had protests and they turned around and went the other way. Anyhow. Oh, at the period of time, I love these political cartoons. Uh, here you have military rule. They shut down the port of Boston. And here you have the America as the Indian princess, you know. Um, and here, <laughs> actually, they're going to get. <laughs> and these are foreigners, land, look at that, you know. And this is Britannia, she's shamed. Oh, it's just is terrible. There's Britannia hiding her. Oh, I don't even want to look at this. <laughs> it's his water. He's, he's, he's keyboarding her. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, I was wondering about this Indian princess thing. I've seen it in some markings. And I'm going, I know I saw that someplace. Where in the hell was it? And they have this statue. They have the original down in the halls of Congress, and I passed by it. And I said, that's where it is. Whoops. It's, um, my, it's, it's up on the Capitol. Yep. Now, what they did was, it's not really an Indian princess. Um, this is the Roman goddess Minerva, who is the protector of civilization. But they kind of put an American thing, they put feathers on her. <laughs> and she became an Indian princess. <laughs> Anyhow, all right. So now in Boston, okay, we come to the, the British. And the British knew that the colonials were getting serious. They were stockpiling munitions. These kind of militia groups, they, they had their spies, and so they said, we're going we're gonna to go out and confiscate these supplies. This, there looks like trouble is brewing here. You know, they're getting out of hand. And this is where you get the thing where they set up the thing to alert everyone, one if I see. One if I land. Two if I see, Charlie. Yeah. 
That's about as bad as the Hawks winning the World Series. <laughs> you have to talk. One of the things I picked up wandering around, I have a nightlight, which is a little lantern, which I have in my house. So I have my own lantern. Anyhow. Anyhow, um, they had the signal there to let, you know, warn the militias when the British, British, well, they're all British, when the regulars were coming. And there we go with Paul Revere. Uh, Revere. Let's see what else. Okay, this is the old North Church. But they set out to disarm the militia. Um, by the way, the Tea Party was not just a little bunch of guys. The whole town showed up to watch this. Supposedly there were 5,000 people cheering them on. So this was the whole thing. Anyhow, Paul Revere set out to warn it. Now, the one thing that happened to Paul Revere, he says, you know, this is real important. And he borrowed a friend's horse. And he happened to be probably one of the finest horses in town. And I'm quite certain he, he told him, like, don't ride him too hard and things like this. But Paul Revere never got too far because the British caught him. They had sentries around, and they took that horse. <laughs> so I think he had some explaining to do, you know. <laughs> Like, what happened to my horse, you know? <laughs> uh, there were, of course, other riders. This wasn't there. They weren't putting all their money on one guy. Uh, the, the one thing I like was Dr. Samuel Prescott. He was one of the riders, too, to alert, alert the countryside. And he dutifully got on his horse. And he traveled to his girlfriend's house. <laughs> called it quits for the night. <laughs> there was another guy, Will Boss. He got around. Actually, there were 15. There were people all over town doing this. This is my photo, by the way. I think it's pretty good. Anyhow, the one that is really gets attention, at least among young women, young adults, is never giving credit to his sibyl on her horse star. And she took up, her dad was in charge of the militia and she said, well, you say her and assemble the troops and I'll go out. But there she is. They, yeah, I never gave much credibility to the story, but they put up a statue, so. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, they recreated every year. You can go out there. And this is a, I wish I should have put a better one in there. This is Graham Wood's picture, right, from here in Chicago. Uh, he did this American Gothic. All right, the militiamen. Um, Minutemen. Well, all right, you hit on a good thing. I call them militiamen. Minutemen were special guys who signed up for the militia. Not everybody, but they're generally called militiamen. The only place the Minutemen are really talked about is here. Um, anyhow, I love these pictures. Here she's crying. Oh no, he's going to war. Heroic dad, oh, dad, they're coming, they're waiting for you. There's another one. Come on, what are you doing? Farming, you know, let's go, you know. Cincinnati. You know. Um, with this one here, she's dragging her husband. Please don't go. Look at, I don't know what this guy's doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's another guy. Get up, you gotta go fight, you know. <laughs> uh, but no, all right. So they sent the writers out, and we're talking, and we get into. I don't talk a lot about battles, but I will focus on this one since a lot of attention is on Lexington and Concord. Um, Let's face it, they were up against the best well-trained army in the world. These, the average British soldier had 10 years experience. They weren't really well liked. Um, they were well-trained and disciplined. And they marched out um, about 800 soldiers towards Lexington and Concord. And here's a map. Uh, Boston, to Lexington and Concord, 
and things didn't go too well for them. As a matter of fact, it's getting a little ahead, but if there hadn't been a relief column, probably this army could, would have surrendered. There were 3,000 militiamen showed up, at least. And they were getting, they were getting hit mercilessly. At least 270 were killed. <coughs> One little story before I forget. There were two, they had some German actions, we'll get into. <laughs> two, two guys got wounded in, in Lexing, or in Concord. Two Germans. And they settled down. And they got to know the people and they married local girls and never returned to the army. <laughs> hey, well, these are nice guys, They're, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, this is Lexington Green if you go there. I'm a little sorry, I went there and I actually walked past it because I didn't realize it wasn't much of a green, you know. <laughs> and I had a walk back, I go, where's the green? And the guy said, you just walked past it, you know. <laughs> Uh, oh, I love these minimen. These pictures of minimen are just great. Look at these guys. They're ready to go. They're pretty. These guys. <laughs> I mean, these are great. Oh, no, these are three of actors, too. These guys are cool. This guy doesn't look like he's going to no, make no. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this is gonna be, these are going to defeat the British you just saw. Yeah. Oh, this is in the Smithsonian, and the German, the British were rampaging the country. They were looting the place, and then rumor got out that they were going to burn down the town. Oh, that one, that really got them out. They actually burned. They got some wagon, the caissons for cannons, and they were burning them. And then people saw that they go, "Well, they're burning our." They guys said, "You going to let them burn down our town?" So everybody and their brothers showed up. You know. But they were looting the town. Oh, uh, and of course, I drew in a little literature here. Actually, you see, they got better weaponry in the town. <laughs> if you look here. Um, but anyhow, there's a little dispute whether the war began at Lexington or Concord. I don't care either way. And there's all sorts of little disputes about this. Um, they're not, they didn't plan at Lexington to fight. Actually, the one thing at Concord, they didn't think, one guy said, hey, they're shooting real bullets. <laughs> he said, they're using real lead, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, I love this little exchange here on Lexington Green, my favorite. This kind of sparked my interest in the whole war. But John Pitcairn, leader of the British troops, yells, disperse you damn rebels. And Captain John Parker of the Minutemen says, stand your ground on fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. Whether or not this actually took place, I actually think it did. But anyhow, um, there are many, many pictures recreating this, some valid or not. It certainly was a conflict. Actually, it's used on being a railroad guy. <laughs> You'll see the Minutemen. Uh, this is what they were going to get. This is an arsenal. And this is what they were marching to get. The other thing they were marching, they were, they were looking. Oh, this is great. They were marching and they also had orders to arrest John Adams, or Sam Adams, and uh, Pat, um, John Hancock. Name? John Hancock. And they came to a, an inn where they were staying. They beat it out of town. And the innkeeper said, hey, the minute the writer shows up and says, you know, uh, the British regulars are coming. And the innkeeper said, hey, keep it quiet, you know, like I've got important guests in my inn. John Hancock and Sam Adams was laying there. He said, you tell those guys to get, get out of here, you know. But anyhow, this is an arsenal. This is what they were uh, going after. There's the Concord Bridge. Um, believe you me, an army did show up. This was, there was militiamen like you wouldn't believe. 
Um, some of the ideas, this is from a book illustration, Wyatt. They look like pirates, they look like a pirate here. <laughs> but actually, this is, this is a British retreating. This whole field was full of thousands of militiamen. That's what I mean. They turn around and skedaddle. Now, when you come back, um, they have to realize 3,000 rebels lined this road. This is called Battle Road. And they had to march back about 16 or 19 miles. <coughs> and actually, the biggest fight, it took, fighting took place all the way. And this is no serious, this is serious fighting. Uh, one of the towns that's not given much credit is a town called Monot Monotomy. And this is where they were even at house fighting and things of that nature. And they even had guys who, old people, old guys who weren't, weren't marching, were too old to march, would sit out in their front yard or shoot out the window. They had one old guy who killed like four British soldiers before they bounced them in the head. <laughs> and then there was another one, there was a guy the British didn't like this at all. There was a guy on the white on a white horse, and he'd ride a ways, and he'd stop, and then he'd carefully aim on the saddle, and he'd shoot a British soldier, and then get up and ride. Though they said, "Watch out for that son of a bitch on the white horse." <laughs> Anyhow, there were conflicts at various intersections. This is kind of a neat picture, I think. Uh, to give you some idea of what went on. Oh, this is, oh, the Lexington Society, Historical Society, has four prints made by Amos Doolittle, who lived there and saw this. And uh, this is the best of them, let me tell you. But these are, they try to hawk this. These are pretty well known. Oh, uh, and tips, eyewitness scene. Anyhow, a lot of you guys, I gotta get moving. A lot of you guys keep talking about Indian fighting. The British knew this. They had fought the Indian War. They had special regiments like infantry of foot. Uh, they said during the whole affair, the rebels attacked us in a very scattered, irregular manner, but with perseverance and resolution, nor did they ever dare to form into a regular body. Indeed, they know too well what was proper to do so. Whoever looks upon them as an irregular mob will find himself very much mistaken. They have men amongst them, this is a very famous quote often used, they have men amongst them who know very well what they are about, having been employed as rangers against the Indians and Canadians. And this country, being very much covered with wood and hilly, is very advantageous for their method of fighting. All right. Let's see, uh, okay, now you got all this battle, and John Adams couldn't believe this. John Dickinson, who wrote this Pennsylvania letters, insisted they do this. He said, oh, we'll send an, a petition to the Crown. Let's be friends, you know. And John Adams said, this is nonsensical. But anyhow, they wanted to have, they still hadn't thought of independence. They thought it was just a, you know, anyhow, the king responded, uh, you, guys, you guys were not fooled by this. It's just the opposite effect. Anyhow, the day after the news, the king said, to heck with your petitions and peace. Out should come what? Tom Paine's common sense. Now, he wrote this inflammatory argument for independence. He couldn't find a printer. I think it was his 10th printer. Finally said, all right, he was published anonymously, by the way. But anyhow, it became a bestseller. There were 100,000 copies of this, and everybody and their brother was arguing, you know. He presents a very compelling argument for independence. Okay. Let's see. And Tories. now the Tories came, I mean, there was a battle of the minds. The Tories came out with their own called Plain Truth, which a lot of people don't know about. And they said, Tom Paine, that's just clackery. Now you can imagine. They're... Okay, now, 
the communists, of course, had assembled. They said, you know, let's we better act together because what's going to happen in Boston can, can happen to all of us. And there was movement to form the Continental Congress. Originally, it was the Stamp Act Congress, but they um, began the, this began the inklings of the unification. They said we have to be like 13 clocks and strike at the same time. Um, Actually, I was going to say, during the, this is getting ahead again, you can't run a war with just this Congress. You had no executive. And what they would do was appoint committees. And there was something like 3,429 3, committees of the Continental Congress. Uh, it just didn't work. Actually, a little bit of historical trivia. The first place they met was the Union Hall, Carpenter's Hall, and then they moved to the State House in Philly. So that's Carpenter's Hall. Uh, the king came out with his proclamation, behave yourself or you're gonna get in trouble. Uh, so they came out with their proclamation, which is the Declaration of Independence. Now the Courier and Ives, and now a whole bunch of people I've often wondered where this decoration came from. Here you see it again. Oh, here's John Hancock. Oh, you can read my name. <laughs> you know, none of these guys, when they published it, they didn't publish their names until about six months later. The it was, it was an actual painting. It wasn't finished. There, what happened to the drums? There you go. There's John uh, Hancock, burial place looking. It was a, not an easy picture to get from me. Look at that. It's way up there. Anyhow, he practiced it. He and the secretary were only the original signers. Uh, one, of the, one of the signers of the declaration, by the way, got scared later in the war and he claimed himself a royal. Well, what did the Americans do? The independence in New York City, they marked the occasion this is a brand new statue, by the way, only about three years old. They decided to pull it down, and they melted it into 42,000 musket balls. <laughs> All right, gotta get moving. All right, you gotta, they said, you know, we better get together, these separate militia groups. Let's get together an army. Who should we pick? George Washington wore his uniform every day to the meetings of the Continental Congress. So then they said, well, we need a general. Hmm, I wonder who we should get. <laughs> Maybe the guy who's dressed like a general. <laughs> no, he was from Virginia. They wanted to bring Virginia to the war. So he said, all right, I'll do it. This is an actual picture of his uniform. And I love this, Bishop Weems, you know about him. Parson Weems. Yeah, Parson Weems, all this do I did about Washington. Yeah. Oh, they actually have a stained glass We're not going to tell a lie. It's all baloney. Here's another one that's baloney. Oh, he had, this book is floating. I have one on my desk. I use it in negotiations and read from it. When I deal with management, uh, he, oh, this was his, he was learning manners and all. He actually had a, they gave this book to him to practice writing as his penmanship. So then they said, oh, this must have been his book, you know. Anyhow, other players on the scene, of course, Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin made a lot of money, so he gets his picture painted. You can see he's got those. Uh, the other guy, this guy really brought about the revolution, John Adams. These, these two guys. Uh, Franklin had represented the colonies in England. He got into a scrape with them, long story short. He left, and actually they were going to arrest him. He said, I'm going to, and he left. He said, I'm going to make your king a little man. They, they really ticked him off. He, wanted, he, was, he was right, he lived there but they really alienated him. Now he shows up later in France. This is a great story. They sent him then to France. They said, you know, they, you all know, sir, they're trying to pick up the allies. But he wore this hat simply because he had a cold. 
<laughs> and then he wasn't well dressed at the time. So they said, oh, he's, he's a new man, the new Republican. And they disavow this royalty. And he wore this hat all the time. And it became the hairstyle. But uh, actually, when he, when he landed in France, the British spies knew this. And I love this thing. They said, the report said, Franklin has landed in in France, they said he is a devious man incapable of telling the truth. <laughs> That's what I am, incapable of telling the truth. Anyhow, all right, I, all kinds of guys, women, Abigail Adams, of course, letters in exchange and her husband, very nice history record, please remember the ladies. Uh, this one's great. We, we saw Lexington and Concord. How did the militiamen know the colonials, the British regulars were coming? Mrs. Gage, she was an American, and with the, the patriots, he couldn't control her, and she alerted them. He was the guy in charge of the British forces of North America. He couldn't control her. He ended up sending her back to England. <laughs> oh, this is a later story. This is my email that I sent out. Uh, Thank you, my dear. This is a goofy story when they were chasing Washington up Manhattan. The British officers ran into this rich lady, and she had a couple of daughters who were pretty good looking, and they purposely said they held them back. So. Washington could escape. Uh, and it was made into a Broadway play. <laughs> and the DIY, this is this story's baloney. All right, my favorite one, we'll take a little break from too much history, is this baloney. <laughs> That's the Ross. This is absolutely not true. Some of you guys know this. The story didn't show up until what, 1870 or something? Uh, uh, but here they got her. I love these pictures. Oh, how does that look, George? You know, here's the flag. You know, oh, look at this one. You, oh, I don't they're not okay, you know? <laughs> oh, here are her sewing circle. <laughs> none of this is, absolutely none of this is valid. <coughs> yeah. Oh, they got it, you know. <laughs> oh, and this is the favorite one. George Washington said, I'd like a six-pointed star. And she shows him that, no, it would be too hard to make those. And this is where she's showing him how to make a star. Like he's sitting around, you know. <laughs> Wondering if it's a seamstress in Philly, you know. <laughs> he got to Valley Forge for this, you know. <laughs> oh, here's another one. Here's the in the star. That's, a, that's, a, that's the type of star we got in stock this day. <laughs> Anyhow, the flag was, uh, the real truth is, uh, the Congress passed a resolution. The stars were all over the place. Betsy Ross Circle. Francis Hopkins, and it was a member, he claimed they might be legitimate because he was with the Naval Committee and it was important to have the ship identification. Anyhow, I threw in, that's the Betsy Ross Circle. A lot of people don't know it's kind of like that. Here's <laughs> I started looking into different designs because I thought we might redesign it. I don't know, this looks like a Japan myself. Uh, Pac Man. <laughs> Oh, in your econ in the Green Party, let's redo it. Um, we're right the 4th of July. No, I am not going to, my cats are not going to sit. My cat Halstead is not going to sit to have his picture taken, dressed up like Yankee Doodle. <laughs> I like this little guy. <laughs> this is terrible. What did you do to that dog? <laughs> Okay. And the theme, we red, white, and blue, is there bowling balls? This is uh, an Indian address. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, I love this one. This kind of 
war, battle flag. This was the inauguration. I was watching the inauguration. They had them across the Capitol. There's the militiamen that marched. Uh, so they paid homage to the flag. Uh, other uses of the flag to trade capitalist headquarters on Wall Street, the New York Stock Exchange. Oh, well, yeah, they're real American. Right. Sure. Oh, uh, came across this. When they, yeah, when they broadcast on TV from the studio in Burbank, California, right. the moon landing, and you thought they were on the moon. Here's a guy there. Here's a woman that made a little cake. <laughs> now, being a real man during the bicentennial, Somebody got the idea of decorating railroad engines, red, white, and blue. So there you got different designs I found for you guys. These are kind of cool. This is Illinois Central. They got a big eagle. Excuse me? Those are kind of neat. This one I like. Uh, Lionel. You get a Lionel. Uh, this always was the state of Maine. This was their color. Uh, red, white, and blue. And then the Freedom Train out of Portland. And of course, red, white, and blue continues with CTA. And there is an advertisement for the meeting this Monday, which I know you all come to. <laughs> and here's another one. Amtrak uses red, white, and blue. And my own railroad. We're a very patriotic railroad. We're serving and providing transportation for America. You know, this logo has never changed in the history of the railroad. Uh, all right, another getting back to women from our little break. There were actually two women, probably many. Uh, the way the story goes, her husband was wounded. Uh, she took over. Normally they brought water. Uh, they were going to take the cannon offline. And she said, no, I'll take over. And there's even stories where she was made a sergeant. There are different women and given pensions. And I, you know, they certainly were camp followers. And, you know, there. This is a really cool story. Agent 355. She was a spy. Even turned in Benedict Arnold. And her true identity has never been discovered. But Washington, this is true. Washington ran a real spy network. He even wrote phony letters all the time. He wrote letters like, oh, we're not doing too well on troops. We only have 15,000. And he knew that he would get into, you know. Anyhow, another woman. Oh, this one is in down south in the Carolinas. Some, some, some uh, loyalists thought they would rampage her farm because she was a, a patriot and she ended up shooting two of them and she held the other three captive, <laughs> the British. <laughs> oh, and one other woman, this is not a happy episode, Peggy Shippen. Who's Peggy Shippen? <laughs> right, yes. Benedict Arnold got put in charge of Philly after the British left. And he met this babe, half his age, really nice looking apparently. They get married. He buys a big place for her on the school kill. Uh, she persuades him. Now he was absolutely, totally a genuine hero. This is the amazing thing he is. He, yes, he got court-martialed. The governor of Pennsylvania was on his case unfairly. Benedict Arnold, they should have statues to him. He, the battles of Belcourt Island, he invaded Canada. He was at Ticonderoga. He won the Battle of Syracuse. This guy was a genuine hero. Did more than anybody. And it, they turned coat for 20,000 years with Bay Beer. But one of the things, so one of the episodes that happened was, he was in charge of West Point, the fort. They even named the fort after him, Fort Arnold. They thought a lot of these guys. So he said, oh, I'll give you plans for the fort. 
and he handed them over to John Andre. John Andre got, he got stopped by some guys and he didn't know they were American soldiers. So he thought they were British. And he goes, I'm a British spy. Don't let me through. <laughs> and this is a mistake on his. Um, and they, were, they said, what? You're British? So they started, and these guys couldn't read. And they found some papers on them. This is a crazy episode. And they said, what the heck is all this stuff? What are you doing with all this stuff? And then he even offered them money to get away. And then he claimed, this whole story got out of here. He claimed they were robbing him. <laughs> Anyhow, this is made into a play. Here's like, they gave medals to these three guys. The highest, <laughs> the highest medals. And they didn't know, they just said, what the hell is this? But anyhow, this is a tragic episode. All right, I'm conflict. I'm not, I don't want to spend a lot of time on war. Um, war stuff. There actually were a few major battles. They could add one or two, whatever. Uh, comparison to Civil War, this was nothing. This probably was a good indication of what they looked like. You know, yeah. Okay, you could get one of these toy soldier sets if you wanted to play little soldier guys. Like you can go along with your Indian set. Yeah. Uh, they certainly, the British in terms of the war, best trained army on earth, and well disciplined, well slide. They took uniforms seriously. These are a little older, but like 1812 type uniforms. Appearance was a big deal to these guys. So when they saw the Americans, they said, you gotta be kidding me. They just, they just shook their heads. They said, look at this guy, this guy's gonna have shoes. They said, these are like, what is this mob? The Germans call them country clowns. <laughs> uh, the British tried to recruit. Uh, I love this here. You can join the British army and you can assist in reducing obedience of your deluded countrymen, and also you'll acquire the polite accomplishments of a soldier. That, that's pretty cool. All right, I gotta hurry up, there's another one. I, I just can't believe this ever happened with these guys. All right, one of my favorites, there we go. Yankee Doodle. Now these are you guys. I look at this, I go, there's the College of Complexes. <laughs> there's Bob Matter. <laughs> look at this. Can you imagine the British when they saw this coming? <laughs> Anyhow, there's some more. I love these guys who recreate this stuff. Let's see, I gotta keep. Let me get my, okay, um, by the way, the militia, when, when Washington showed up outside of Boston to assemble all the state militias into a unit, he said, if I had known it in advance what I would have to deal with, I never would have taken this job. They only had nine rounds of bullets each and things. They spent a lot of time just making bullets. Um, Anyhow, regular army. Uh, I love this one. This guy doesn't even know how to fire a gun. Uh, <laughs> and oh, here we go. This probably was accurate too. They were, oh, look at their persevering. Yeah, this kind of deal. I have this picture at home actually. But Washington was trying to form, and he stressed to the course of the war was to turn them into a regular army. Um, you know, this is what he wanted. They have different, I'm seeing here, colors. Actually, I, I copied this poster, and I didn't realize it had an email address on it. <laughs> Anyhow, Bunker Hill, first big battle. The British took it. This was a slaughter. They lost 50% of their troops. Going uphill, you fight straight. They didn't give much regard to the Americans. 
went uphill, lost. That's just, you never lose 50% of your troops. It just, it just, and it, the Americans ran out of ammunition. But it was watched. They, the Americans said, I wish we could sell them another hill at the same price. This made big news in England. I mean, they lost a thousand soldiers. The armies weren't that big. They won battle with these, these colonials. That's what I mean, and even the British said, in Parliament, he said, eight more victims. They only had 8,000 in the whole army. He said, eight more, and no one left, no one left to tell them to talk about it. No army left. You know, there's one battle. Oh, we know the British were in occupied uh, Boston. They still. And they had a shutdown, and they said, well, the one thing, Washington is putting together an army. He said, you know, we need, we don't have cannons. And being Americans, they said, well, we know where we can get some. And they had Fort Ticonderoga up on the Hudson. I said, well, one guy said, General Knox, he actually was a bookseller like me. He wanted to become an artillery, artillery officer. He read a book, or two books on the subject. <laughs> and he said, I'd like to get some cannon. <laughs> So they took off the cannon and put that for tie. And this is how some of this nonsense of history comes in. Uh, here you've got the Green Allen and the Mountain, the uh, Ethan Allen, Ethan Ethan Allen. Allen and the Green Mountain Boys, and Bernard the Cardinal too. And oh, this is this is the great battle of Fort Ticonderoga. They knocked on the door, and supposedly said. In the name of the great Jehovah and the Continental Congress, surrender. I demand you surrender. What he actually said was, come out, you old rat. <laughs> but actually, this is incredible. During the French and Indian War, the British had lost 2,000 soldiers capturing this fort. We did it by knocking on the door. <laughs> Anyhow, this guy went up from north and the, actually they were pretty smart. He said he, it was winter time, so they put the cannon, they had a lot of them. There's, there's like 62 tons of cannon. And they put them on sleds, and because it was winter time, they could get it down 300 miles to Boston. They put the cannon around Boston, the British took off. And that was the last the British. Uh, as a matter of fact, at that point, there were no British soldiers when they evacuated Boston, because they had these cannons. They, there were no British soldiers in the 13 colonies. They went up to Nova Scotia. So they got pretty heady. They said, wow, we just kicked out the British Army. <laughs> but not for long. They put together an, art, an artillery a flotilla of 130 30 vessels and came back and landed in New York. This was the Empire Strikes Back, times 10. This was the largest sea and, arm and land army ever assembled. The British were not effing around. And they landed, they had 32,000 soldiers and 8,000 Hessians they hired from Germany. And this is probably accurate, they showed up in New York uh, well, I'm going to go through this real quick. Four cities are concerned. We've been through Boston. New York, they held through the war. Philly, the British took, and then later got, they, they gave back, they evacuated it. And Charleston and the south the latter part of the war, they took that. But that was all they took. Even in Parliament, the guy said, when the guy said, you only control the land where you're decamped. These towns, you know, you don't control it. Actually, this picture, <coughs> talk about, and I know you guys, the sword history guys, like, uh, this is the most incredibly inaccurate picture that could ever be. Um, this guy was being yelled at. He's looking down because he didn't attack. The battle hadn't started. What's all this going on? And there was no battle. <laughs> and certainly not this. I mean, 
he got court-martialed for that because he didn't, he was supposed to start the battle. And George came along and said, I don't hear any shooting. What's going on, you know? Anyhow, uh, New York was a disaster. I'm going to skip over that. They got chased out. And then the British thought they were going to have one big battle and capture all the Americans and the war was over. And it almost happened in New York. They came darn close. The Americans escaped at night. And this was not according to the code at the time. They thought, well, we'll go tomorrow and we'll, they're surrounded, they'll surrender. They got on boats at night and skedaddled out of, into Manhattan, actually. But they were gone. The British shut up the next morning. They said, what kind of guys are these? They're supposed to, like, surrender. <laughs> and they're gone. <laughs> and they ran all the way out of New York, long story short. The lowest point of the year, everyone, there was desertions, didn't look too good. Anyhow, they needed a victory. This is where it came along, Trenton. December 26th, they're in camp. Washington says, we need a victory. Um, they sneak up in winter. Uh, in the middle of a snowstorm, they actually, as I was telling him, they didn't think anybody would be out in this storm. They moved that night, marched nine miles, surprised the garrison of 800 Hessians, and it was over in an hour. They went along and then got Princeton. So they got a victory. It was like from the blows of defeat. Um, if you go to the New York Metropolitan, this is one painting now. This is no fooling painting. This is probably how it really looked. Last votes. And I love these guys who recreate the war. You know, these are pretty cool. Going too fast. Um, okay, there were two winners. They, the war was conducted in campaigns. Summer campaign, you have to think about it, all campaigns. And in winter, nobody fought. Valley Forge actually wasn't that bad. They didn't have food, but it wasn't cold. I lived on Valley, outside of Valley Forge. And they, they were all, actually they had a contest. Who could build the nicest cabin and the fastest? Washington gave prizes. And they, this was actually a mild winter. The next two winners in Norristown, um, Morristown, New Jersey, that is considered the worst winter in the history of North America. That was really bad. So Valley Forge was, actually I've walked it. It's an, okay, well the guy who showed up in Valley Forge, Von Steuben, they had all these Europeans show up. And this guy told them he was, oh, he was telling the Prince of Russia how to fight war. He has nothing but a captain. But that's what they needed. They needed to get an army together, and he was the number one guy. He put them together on how to march. Another guy shows up. I love this. I can never remember his name. Marie Joseph Paul Yves Gilbert de Mottier, Marquis de Latia. What kind of guy has a name called Marie? What <laughs> 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 a sissy. <laughs> Anyhow, another guy showed up being pulled. This Casimir, that's my, that's my name in Lithuania, Casimir. He shows up, actually tragically he got killed, but he was a cavalry officer. Another guy on that, that was a Lithuanian that showed up. Uh, yes, Darius Kuskusko was born in Lithuania. So the Lithuanians won the war. I thought Kuskusko was Polish. No, he was born in Lithuania. Uh, when I mentioned his name, the Lithuanian, my Lithuanian friend knew right away. He said, oh, you said it wrong. All right, then we said there way, way back in the beginning of time, Indians, the leader of the Indians was this guy, Dayan Dunandea, otherwise known as Joseph Brandt. He was an Indian raised by the chief of the Indian service of the British been the London, six Iroquois tribes, four went with the British, 
because they knew if they went with the Americans, the Americans were land hungry. The British weren't. But the one Indian, I think, he, he was today at some council fires. And he said, to, you know, Aoki, he's trying to tell him, come on, let's join in another fight. And the one Indian responded, he says, war is war and death is death. Meaning, this is not just like stuff, you know, like this is like death, you know. And he said, I'm not having anything to do with this. Anyhow, if you want to read anything, you got to get moving. If you want to read anything at all, oh, geez, am I over? Oh, uh, Saratoga is a fun one. Gentleman Johnny Bergen, they sent this dandy. Uh, the Americans, they're going to march south and take Albany. The Americans knocked down trees, flooded streams. They were going to make like, they said, oh, let's go by land. It'll be easy. It's a shortcut. Uh, in the meantime, every colonial, uh, some of the things they wrote back, again, the Germans said you can't, they had no forest in Europe. Here you get old growth forest in there. Uh, one of the things that happened was a uh, gentleman, Johnny Bergine, said you Americans better behave yourself. I've got 500 Indians and I can let them loose. So, what it was a tragic incident. Jane McCray got caught by some Indians. She was the fiance of a British general and she got killed. They tried to spin the story by saying she got shot. They were trying to cheat the Indians. Anyhow, they sold her scalp and gave it as a gift. And this story got out. And the colonial said if that can happen to their own women, what do you think is going to happen to ours? Anyhow, it's an ugly here. There you go, selling scalps. Oh, another here up there. I like this. Berk this is um, Berkmer, and even though he was wounded, he continues up in Saratoga area. There, this is Ariskany. He continues to fight. There you go. I like this shot. Here. It's pretty cool. This is what your sharpshooters looked like. <coughs> they were a very an element and the armies, right, they, uh, they quickly in war at sea, John Paul Jones, we talked about foreigners, his name was not Jones, he was wanted, and he changed his name, conveniently, <laughs> oh, and then the U.S. Navy, he's no oh, don't fight, I've not yet begun to fight, the U.S. Navy actually found his grave in Europe, he went on to fight, he was actually a pirate, at least according to the British. He actually did attack the British Isles, the first time they were attacked in 700 years. Uh, they didn't have much of a navy. They would get schooners and put some boats on it. The other thing they tried, these gunboats, this were on Lake Champlain. Oh, they even tried a submarine. <laughs> and this, uh, yeah, they tried this in New York Harbor and it didn't work. <laughs> they were going to screw dynamite to boats and then pull away and there was one. It was going to blow up through the ship. Uh, in the West, there wasn't much war. George Rogers Clark was in Indiana. Why right did this? He marched, I think, 150 miles through frozen trees and creeks. They didn't expect him. That's how you see him walking through water. He got, this is another battle. They didn't even fight. They just said, they, because they're like French, so they didn't like the British to begin with. Even this sense? guy, what he asked was, he said, where's your army? <laughs> they just surrendered. <laughs> uh, down south, the war moved. Francis Marion, lieutenant guy, never stayed more than one or two nights in the same spot, Willow Fighter. Another guy, Charles Sumter. This is another guy. These are guerrilla fighters in the South. Uh, Charleston was taken, and there was no American army down there, so they kept the fight on. Another guy down there, uh, Barrister Tarrington. He was, Tarleton, he was guilty of a massacre. He's a dandy. 
and they asked, he killed 350 soldiers, Americans who were surrendering. Mm. It backfired. It was the worst mistake. Anyhow, he got his cup up his leader. Uh, another one I'll get quickly here. The Battle of Kings Mountain. Uh, this guy here, Major Ferguson. Another one, he got, he, uh, he issued a proclamation to these country guys and they wouldn't buy into this at all. They got a little upset with him. Matter of fact, he said even they surrounded him and he was losing in battle even at that point. He said, I'm never going to surrender to these bad D bandits. <laughs> he called them none of them but them two. bandits. They shot him eight times. <laughs> well, at least eight guys claimed it. Uh, the war in the South, two heroes, General Morgan, <coughs> he felt the militia always ran. They weren't good at fighting British. What he did was, he was the only guy who figured out they had regular army and militia. He put the militia up front. He said, I want you guys to fire maybe one, two, or three shots, then run away. And then the irregular army will come up and fight the battle. It worked. Even the British thought the Americans were retreating, and he figured it out how to do this. He had these sharpshooters. He used them to put off in trees. The British didn't know they had these turkey calls. And they said, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, Nathaniel Green is another. He won the war. He was a quartermaster, and he said, listen, no one, I want to be a general. I want to be some fighting man. And he... But him and Morgan didn't have much of an army in the South. They'd lost to the British. He actually divided the two armies. They divided me up, and they said, let them chase us. And where the hell? They went off into the Carolina wilderness. And they were chased and chased. And, and this guy was really cool. Quartermaster, he was not just running around. He had stockpiled supplies. He had rivers, he knew there were all kinds of rivers. He had boats hidden there and ready. They said, how, how are we going to catch this summer? The British even burned all unnecessary equipment. They said, we're going to catch them one way or another. They, actually, they had some battles. There you see, he had boats hidden. There were uh, two rivals for Washington. This guy came to know General Gates, came to know his Granny Gates. They said he should know he only should raise chickens. He was another guy, Charles Lee. He was another guy. He was court-martialed. So Washington had his opponents. The French show up in the character of uh, Rochambeau. Rochambeau took, they said, take a look at the Americans and give us an assessment. And he wrote back to France. He said, send uniforms, send rifles, send money. He said, Send everything. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, they, the British were, they were hugging the sea. They trapped them on Yorktown. A siege began. Siege warfare. They were surrounded. Their seats were all surrendered. Many pictures of the surrender. Uh, Actually, the story goes, Cornwall, actually, he was giving the sword to Rochambeau, and Rochambeau says, uh, Monsieur, you made a mistake. The sword goes to General Washington. Uh, there's more to this. Washington, then he leaves the army. Oh, they're belly aching, please. Oh, cry baby. This is a baloney. He's a soul in, in New York. Oh, we're so sad. He retired uh, his estate, and he, he was kind of happy there. And, and then he became, look at that God. Look at this one. He's a general. These are various things around Washington I've seen. This is the uh, Masonic Hall, where he was, of course, Mason, became president. So he's, he's wearing very um, spun clothing, he's a man. Oh, and the other thing, the thing I was left out, I won't get into the, the loyalists, they had a ski-daddle. 
It was a problem. I mean, obviously, this is amazing. This is a raid of, of British loyalists who raided a farm. It was that. I, I won't get into this, but it actually was like, like I guess the town wanted to do something historic, but it was like they they attacked a farmhouse, which there was nobody in but some women and a woman and her children, and, and burned her out. I'm like, they recreated this event. I'm proud of you. Know, yeah, yeah, there you go. Look at the statue. Oh, yeah, let them get out. Get out. That's what you have. Get beat it. Yeah. Get out of here. Get out of yeah. yeah, there you go. Hey! Yeah! <laughs> yeah I knew you were. I knew you were making it. Man, now you're all Yankee Doodles. There we go. Whoops. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, shit. Hey, how did I Hey, she got a lot of sisters in there. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're Wait a minute, I didn't get the right. last one. Oh boy. It's not PowerPoint, is it? Yep. It is PowerPoint. It's PowerPoint. Okay. Good page. Oh, it's 2013. Oh, that's changed a lot. Let's just wrap it, Charlie. 20 years. How do I get the uh, slideshow? Interesting. You don't turn it, let's just go right to reverse. Boston, I didn't hear all your question. I don't know. My a question scout. was about the Mansfield decision that was in England, that I think uh, slavery was ended in, in England, and I think Columbus, is it, was it Mayfair? Or? No, when Washington arrived, he was surprised to find free blacks in the army, and they were integrated in which didn't happen until Truman did it. But uh, the Southerners, the, I'll summarize very quickly. 
the British issued two proclamations uh, that if blacks escaped uh, and joined the army, they would be given their freedom. Uh, two proclamations. And uh, they were trying, of course, to undermine the colonial economy. Uh, the colonies also came along later, beginning with Rhode Island, and they, they had quotas. And so they were filling the quotas with blacks who volunteered. And I believe the owners were compensated by Rhode Island for yeah. that. I don't know that much. A long story short, there were about, there's all kinds of figures floating around. Uh, about 5,000 served in the American Army and 10,000 in the British. One of the ugliest episodes was when Cornwallis was surrounded at Yorktown and the provisions were low. They expelled all the black soldiers without weapons in, and even though they had built the fortifications. They're ugly up as now after the war, the way I've read all kinds of things happened. If you want to know more, I know where to look. The National Park Service issues a publication. A nice little book. I must confess I haven't read it. Next question. You're getting into constitutional stuff. Not during the war. Hey, I got a question, Charlie. Not at all during okay, the war. My question is, how come, you know, I mean, most of the actual militiamen were fairly young, and how come all the reenactors are, are, are a bunch of fat, <laughs> old guys that, that look like look like they're old enough to have been in the Vietnam War? Oh. And and actually, I had a girlfriend that was in a British regiment, and I almost joined the British side. She was going to make me a drummer. I said I don't want a gun. But, oh no, they they're pretty cool guys. I don't know. I, I was a reenactor. Oh, you were? Yeah, I know what the reenactors are. Civil War. But I know. Yeah. They're all a bunch of fat old guys. All right. All right. What else? Yeah. Yeah. That's Charlie, the best you, barely, you got. Yeah. You, you barely mentioned the Freemasons, and they were a very prominent part. Oh. Well, that? you know more than I do, I do. I not aware of the Freemasons. One third of the signers of the Declaration. Washington was a member of the Masons. Yeah, I'll say what is that established. Benjamin Franklin was the I, top man I, in Philadelphia. Yeah, and there's... The I, I love conspiracies, too. You know. I'd have to defer to you on this. I, I, you know, they're joint corps, you know. Yeah, uh, getting back to uh, Colonel Carrollton uh, in uh, the Carolinas, uh, is, it, is, is it true or not that his methods were considered so repugnant, even by the British, that had he lived, he probably would have been court-martialed by the British themselves for all kinds of crimes? Uh, okay, what happened was the British took Charleston, but they didn't capture all the Americans. And 350 of them got out of town in the Carolinas. And this guy, Bloody Tarleton, was a dragoon. He's a cavalry. And he caught up with them. And the American long story short, they surrendered. And even though they didn't have to, but he, they surrendered and he just charged into them and they killed them. It was a massacre. Like the leader of the colonial society, I don't like it, no, it wasn't. But he supposedly cut this guy's head in half. <laughs> and he, nothing happened to him. He got a little reprimand. Now there were other massacres. They only 
There's Matt Anthony Wayne. And I don't think anything happened to the British. No, but no, they, they really didn't do anything. They told him, you know, maybe he was young. Uh, Charlie, I have a question. The best little stories of the American Revolution. It's very common. You Civil War guys probably know there's the best little stories of the Civil War. They're short little three-page stories, readily available. Uh, other books, National Park Service has a nice little book out that they sell at their locations. Uh, Smithsonian has a really nice simple book, well illustrated question and answer. Now the rest of the stuff gets drier, you know. Oh, well, there's ones out there almost a miracle. David McGowan's got a book out. There's, a, there's books on every battle. And every every guy. So best, I'll give you a copy. You can use mine. Best little stories of the and the short little stories. The good stories. Well, okay. Let's go to rebuttals. Right. What do you got here? You your hero. Let's go to rebuttals. 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 You, you don't know how to set up. Uh, Europe uh, and a few other places at the same time, they would have had very easily the resources necessary to uh, crush the uh, American Revolution. Okay, they were talking about when the French came in, they pulled about 5,000 troops, I think. I, have, I got it in here. Or maybe about, about 5,000 out. Uh, no, I don't think. They weren't winning this war. Troops weren't doing it. That was the thing. How, the question you got put out in Parliament is, how long is this going to go on? They went to a series of generals. Gage, uh, Howe brothers, uh, Clinton. Uh, yeah, I mean, how, Cornwallis. Yeah, for how many more? You're throwing more soldiers, and they actually ended up not occupied. What did they occupy after seven years? New York City and Charleston. Did you draw a comparison between the American Revolution and the travails England was going through uh, because of this irregular uh, warfare that was taking place? and our own experience in Vietnam, where while we had the superior training, the superior troops and all that, we frankly lost the war because we didn't understand how the enemy was fighting, which is exactly how we were fighting 200 years earlier. All right, in answer to this question, is it like Vietnam? But you, I gotta challenge you. The Americans, Washington, wanted to have a regular army. And the French weren't coming in unless there was an army there. And it, yeah. And they really became the army he wanted. By the time the last battles, they, even the militia, amazingly, they sent the militia out there. They thought they would take it, maybe run. They ended up standing their ground and fighting. They turned into a professional army. So they were the same, they were on equal terms. They fought battles and the British, that's why they never lost. They gave up on this one quick battle. They would go out and fight, like, what is it, Mammoth Courthouse? That battle went on for eight hours. And uh, the hottest day of the year, I didn't know how they fought. You only get like 30 cartridges. 36, they fought all day long. This was an army, they turned into an army. They were not, they were not that rabble anymore. Okay. And they fought, like Green, Green went out and fought with I mean, they had sharpshooters, 
skirmishes and all this. Actually, one of the things that they did fight that was they never gave up on was that the British would go out and forage the countryside for supplies, but all these guys were out there till finally the British couldn't go out foraging, if you want pillaging for food, unless they sent out 500 guys at one time. The countryside was full, but they turned into the regular army. They did. Okay. Uh, All right. You can tell us more. This is a very absurd question, but at the point of the revolution, at what point do Americans start to have an American accent as opposed to a British accent? Is that well, I, uh, and they probably already did. They didn't all talk British. <laughs> um, there's all kinds of things about um, when the troops get got together and met people from other parts of the country. And there's all kinds of things about, I don't even know what they're saying. Um, they, the British actually even there's one account where they were kind of remarking on what kind of strange British they heard in New England. <laughs> but the Southerners were, they had. And um, one of the things that came out after the war was um, the, that's where you got the spelling book. They said, we're going to have American English. And, the, and the other thing I should tell you, you like, you like, that indentured servitude disappeared like that after the war. It's non-existent. They really believe that. That's all you got? Yeah, let's go to our bottles. Sissy British. There we go, you got one more? Yeah, I just a quick one. I tried not to. Was there I don't remember. I don't know. I think well, that guy's an idiot. Whatever. I just, I couldn't. He is he supposed to be Francis Marion? Yeah, uh, I, I, I might have a glance at, but he is just too irritating. Rebuttal. Yeah, the war in the South is really fascinating. It was, it turned into just partisan people fighting. There were 103 battles. They were just killing each other in which no one in uniform fought. It was like, you'll believe it. <laughs> they got out of hand. You had to declare yourself a patriot or a loyalist. And then they went after each other, well, oh, I'll get that son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah, oh, the squirrel hunting. Actually, there was a guy in Boston, Boston Dale. He said, he said, you're all squirrel hunters. He said, I love the American generals, too. He said, shoot a leg them, shoot them in the leg. He said, because it'll take, you shoot one British soldier in the leg, it'll take two others to carry them out. So you get rid of three soldiers at once. <laughs> Sit leg them, boys. <laughs> okay. uh, I think it's about time. Yeah, yeah all right. Yeah. Yeah. So, Pop in, right? Thank you, Tom. Okay. Uh, how many here have some contributions to make? Over here, Brian. 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 One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, uh, About eight. four minutes. Right. Uh, Twenty minutes each. Uh, five minutes each. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim, you can keep the time. Got it. All right. Very good. Okay. Starting with uh, Jeff, Jeff Rama. Yeah. As long as, uh, as long as I might as well, so we can get right into. Starting with the, some of the historical stuff. The movie The Patriot with Mel Gibson and his opponent is, Tar is, is the Tarleton character. Tarleton never burnt a church with sins. No, he didn't. He shot up a bunch of 
guys that were surrendered. And there's controversy as to how it happened. He ended up getting elected to Parliament. Yes, right. So he was not, by British lights, a war criminal. But it was controversial. Because there was reason to suspect the guys wanted to surrender and that he didn't have cause to shoot. All right. But to make a broader point, to go back to Pat's question about this thing in Vietnam. There are, there are analogies, but Chuck did a good job of explaining the major difference in this is that the U.S. had an army in being, and the fact that the whole point of the war from the British was that, yeah, as long as that army was known to exist, you'd have the Lafayettes and the von Steubens and all these blokes, more and more of them would come over, and interest in the rest of the world would grow in what Washington was up to. So the burden of attack, as it were, was on the Brits, okay? And eventually, yeah, it turned out that the frogs came into the war, and when that happened, um, then it was much more difficult. Now, it's worth mentioning that even the frogs coming into the war in and of itself was not necessarily enough to win it for, for Uncle Sam, but... Yorktown there is a conversation the there that is disturbing. Can you tell them to shut up okay, well, or go somewhere else they're, to they're talk? Who knows? They're not, whatever. That's, anyway, um, if I can have another few seconds on the conversation. Uh, yeah, well, they did this. Yorktown was won by the French Navy. The Brits hadn't lost a naval battle in hundreds of years. Britain ruled the waves. But the, the, for once in the whole history of the British Navy, the British Navy got whooped outside of Yorktown. And, and so the ordinary ability of the British Navy to bail, in this case, case Cornwallis's chestnuts out, was stopped by the French. The French blockaded Yorktown. The Brits tried to break the blockade. They couldn't do it. That's why Yorktown had to that's why Colonel Wallace had to quit. Now, it's also worth mentioning, to begin with, what, 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 that the Brits were able to do as what they were able to do was, in its day, a remarkable feat. The Brits managed to keep going across the sea, and was just in terms of organizing the logistics and having the British army and supplies going back and forth across the Atlantic with pirates and storms and all this stuff. The, the Atlantic is a, a hell of a rough neighborhood. And to have to send this much stuff as fast as they would have to send it back and forth was, it, was considered in its day sort of a remarkable achievement. Now, one other factor to keep in mind here. The Brits, then they, they didn't been in a few wars on the continent over recent generations, all right? You know, you take a look at the map of the, a map of the European continent where those wars were fought, mainly in, in, in France and Holland and, 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 and Western Germany. The area there is only a couple hundred miles of effective frontage is where these battles were fought. The U.S. East coastline is, is what, a thousand miles or something? In other words, the territory, the Brits were not used to, to dealing with such a vast theater of operations. Now, the British Navy could land an army anywhere they damn well wanted, whenever they wanted, New York or Charleston or whatever it was. But, still, once you got there, okay, so now you've got New York. What the hell do you do with it? You've got to go and find Washington. And here's the other thing, that, that Washington, you know, the, the, the Washington got his ducks together and the U.S. Army moved a lot by boat up and down rivers. This was before railroads. This is before railroads. Rivers were the main means of fast transportation in this period. And so you would, yeah, you'd be crossing rivers or going up and down rivers or whatever. Um, and so it was, you'd have to do embarking and disembarking and all was a big, big deal. Okay, I suppose, if I, do I have another minute left or we're over? No, your, your time's up. That's it? Okay. Okay, thank you, Doug Frog. The best. The best.
I'm Mark. You want more tea, sweetheart? No. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, Thank sorry. You. I did like the presentation. I'm glad I was here. Oh, yeah, you listen to it. Where's the microphone? I don't know. It's not working. Right? 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 Oh, all right. Probably. Anyway, I did like your presentation, Charlie. Charlie told us the beginning of the story. I'm going to make a couple of remarks about the end of the story. Something happened in this country about two months ago, and something also happened in this country about 20 years and two months ago. 20 years and two months ago, there was an incident that occurred. It involved law enforcement officials from city, state, county, and federal law enforcement agencies. And it also involved the United States Army. It was the siege at Waco, Texas. That siege ended on April 19, 1993. And the notable thing about it was that this was a giant law enforcement operation that lasted approximately two months. And for the last two to three weeks, the United States Army was involved in it, one way or another. We were told that the Posse Comitatus Act, whatever the details of that are, was not violated because the law says the United States Armed Forces cannot conduct law enforcement operations in the United States of America, and the United States Army did not conduct law enforcement operations. All law enforcement operations were conducted by city, state, local, county, federal law enforcement officials, and the United States Army assisted law enforcement officials. And that's the key. <coughs> two months ago, there was an incident that occurred in Boston. There were two bombs detonated at the Boston Marathon, and four days later, again, law enforcement officials from all kinds of agencies took a man into custody. This happened exactly 20 years to the day later, on April 19, 2013. And again, members of the United States Armed Forces were involved in this operation. There was a, a unit, some kind of bomb disposal or bomb defusing unit from the United States Navy. Somehow they were involved in this operation. But again, we were told the Posse Comitatus sure. Act was not violated. The members of the United States Armed Forces were not conducting law enforcement operations. They, again, assisted. That's the key. They did not conduct operations. They assisted law enforcement agencies who were conducting law enforcement operations. Now, I never went to law school. I'm not any kind of an attorney at law. But there's something about 20 years. I don't know what it is about 20 years in the law. I don't know if it's got something to do with some statute that's written in the federal statute. I don't know if it goes all the way back to British common law. I don't know. But these two incidents, the final cataclysmic event at Waco, and when the man was actually taken into custody near Boston, those two events occurred exactly 20 years apart. And I believe what that means is now, in that 20 year period, nobody complained except there's millions of people complaining, but they were called nut shots like me, conspiracy freaks like me. Just pushed off to the side and ignored. There's no lawsuits and there's court decisions about these matters. I think that what that means is now any law enforcement operation can be conducted by one guy a domestic law enforcement official, whether it's a city police officer or a federal agent, and 10 or 20,000 American soldiers. All you got to do is have one guy who's a law enforcement official saying he's conducting some kind of a law enforcement operation, and the entire United States Armed Forces can participate in this in any way. Soldiers, tanks, airplanes, bombs, rockets with nuclear-tipped missiles, anything. I believe we are now in 
in a military dictatorship. And I'm not joking, I'm not trying to exaggerate. The United States of America, the system of government we have now, is a military dictatorship. That's what Charlie was talking about the whole time he was up here. He was talking about people living in the 13 colonies who fought a war against a military dictatorship. And I believe that we have now come full circle. That's all I got. I, uh, this is one of the best presentations I've ever seen at the College of Complexes. I also want to say this is one of the best presentations I've seen by Charlie. Uh, and I've been, you know, I've been coming to the college for 13 years. Um, you know, with all the stuff that's been happening the last few years, you know, especially with like what some of the stuff Mike was talking about just now, like four weeks before I got on, and some of the stuff that went on during the Bush years. And, 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 and Obama, it's easy to become cynical about this country and say, ah, you know, it's all a bunch of horse shit. But seeing this presentation from Charlie, from, the, from a leftist of all, of all people, made me proud to be an American again. It made me remember what this country's all about, how this country came into existence, you know, what we fought for. And I guess I'm starting to, when I say we, I actually have an ancestor that fought in the American Revolution. His name was Reuben Jackson. He's uh, an ancestor of my father, and and he was he was actually at the Battle of Bunker Hill. And um, I was recently, you know, when I was uh, watching this thing, I've been to Boston. I've been to a lot of places in Charlie's Charlie's photos. I've been to Boston to the, to the State House, the site of the Boston Massacre, and and just. Last Christmas, I visited the, the uh, battlefield of Yorktown. Uh, most of the land where the British fort stood at Yorktown is now um, has been washed out to sea now uh, because of the rising ocean levels. And um, but anyway, I just want to say that I thought this was a really good presentation and uh, well done, job, Charlie. Yay! Good evening. Uh, I'm a Vietnam vet, so we know that most of these wars are all about money. War is very profitable, unless you're kind of stupid like buddy over here. No, where'd he go? Oh, over there. He knew about how the uh, British couldn't expand their uh, sea coast and, and win something so they were bound to lose and then ship stuff from England to America I mean how much of this stuff is at the bottom of the sea right now okay and that was like when um, the uh, English were sending people to Australia I've been to Australia twice there's a place called Shipwreck Bay down south of uh, Melbourne people would get within a mile of shore and a uh, storm would come up and they all went to the bottom. A few maybe grabbed a log or something like that or a piece of a mast and floated in and survived, but many of, many of these people went to the bottom, which was just fine with the Americans. I mean with the Americans, with the Australians and the, and the English too. So along with the slaves. Question about the slaves here, okay? These slave boats, many of those went to the bottom of the ocean and these slaves were shackled to the oars so that if there was a storm, the uh, crews got off the ship, and that was about it. The rest of them went to the bottom. This man's inhumanity to man. And I'll tell you what's happening every day here in the United States. 2,200 Americans are being buried every day by the AMA. There's a, back in Vietnam, back in the 60s, when I headed for uh, Vietnam, 1965, we had a little thing, uh, hey, hey, LBJ, how many vets did you kill today? Well, now it's hey, hey, AMA, how many Americans did you kill today? Uh, two, on 2,200 every day. I have a radio show twice a week that's streamed around the world. 
With approximately 42 million listeners, Wednesdays and Fridays. And I keep a count of doing the math. Every, uh, from Friday to Wednesday, I broadcast on Wednesdays and Fridays. From Friday to Wednesday, 11,000 Americans are killed by the AMA. From Wednesday to Friday, 4,400 are dead. As of, that was five minutes? Yes. Well, we only got about three more speakers. Right, should we're, I get up we're, again? We're, we're, we're keeping the time. Let's let the next speaker go, because there'll be more. All right, fine. All right. Uh, the previous speaker made a disparaging remark about somebody else here present, and I, I would I hope that uh, we will all uh, avoid doing similar. Okay. Thank you. Excuse me, Doc. Didn't an ancestor of yours uh, participate in the Revolutionary War? Uh, that fellow that went around trying to sell remedies for fibromyalgia? <laughs> <laughs> it's a scam. No, no, it's been pure. Yeah. Just kidding. Uh, anyway, uh, I uh, I always like to tell uh, people that I meet who are Italian that uh, they're uh, descended from Martians. And when they get up in arms and ask me why, I tell them, will you agree that in all myth there is some reality and they when they agree to that i tell them that according to the myth elita uh whose civilization on mars was dying out took her two babes and uh, jumped to the planet earth and that uh, she died in the fall and her two babes uh were uh raised by a suckled by a she-wolf and uh, they grew up to found Rome and that was Romulus and Remus. So uh, I, the reason I mention this is because that in all myth there is some reality and Charlie was saying that a number of the things in the American Revolution were a myth. Well I guess some of them were in any really great happening, some myth will usually grow up out of it, along with a lot of truths. But the um, uh, truth of our revolution cannot be denied. Uh, this ragtag bunch of rebels that were made fun of by uh, people all over the world, they defeated the biggest most modern empire on the entire planet. Something that Americans who were the most modern, uh, uh, most powerful country in the world could not do in Vietnam, couldn't do in, Iowa, in Afghanistan, uh, mostly were unable to do in Iraq, and there was another country called Mogadishu that uh, is a nothing place, and uh, Clinton sent an army there, and uh, we were unable to do it there. Yet, we were able, as Americans, who fought on the side of that which was right, we wanted to be left alone. It, taxes and a lot of things that were drummed up as, as reasons for it. Uh, John Adams touched on it a little bit when he said that it had gotten to the point where none of us could be too sure who our fathers were because British soldiers were going around and doing the things soldiers do. So the fact is that uh, there came a time where we had to draw the line. We had to to throw up uh, uh, British authority and establish our own country. And as our founders said, these colonies 
ought by right to be free. Uh, they specified in the declaration that uh, man is disposed to suffer, suffer evils while evils are sufferable, and that uh, finally when there comes a time that uh, they are no longer sufferable, that uh, they, they have a right, they have a duty to throw up those bonds and establish new ones. And uh, it was specified that they would submit facts before a candid world. And they specified all the things the king had done, which were numerous. So we were absolutely right. Providence, there's a, there's a saying that is a favorite of mine, that Providence tends to side with those who dare. We dared, and we won. I want to say one more thing before I finish. Molly Pitcher could walk past the troops with her hat and get it filled with half crowns. So there was no myth about that. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to say a few words about the Mel Gibson film of Patriot. Uh, it was not realistic for the reasons that Jeff pointed out and some of you didn't. Uh, first of all, the tar the tar as he said, the Tarleton character in the movie, did, uh, the one who, who entrapped all those people in the church and burned it, the only time I know that anything like that happened anywhere was in 1944 in a French village. If I mispronounce the French, you can correct me at Ordor Souvlan, where, where, the, where the Nazis did indeed bottle up civilians in a church and set fire to it. The British did nothing like that during the Revolutionary War. Also, there's another scene in the movie where the uh, British arrive at the Mel Gibson character's plantation, and they said, oh, you guys are slaves, and we're going to free you. And the slaves say, oh, we're not slaves. We just work the land. We just work here. You know, baloney. Uh, they were indeed slaves. Charlie, I've been admiring your hat all evening. I was intended to ask you, are you in a position to tell us whether they're coming by land or by sea? Um, the ad you saw in there for the Revolutionary War Toy Soldiers, that ad was take, had to have been taken from a comic book because it ran in comic books for years. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, so do I. What's what's the harm in that? Um, I'm, I you you de, you de, you did not you you how shall I say this? You kind of de-emphasized the suffering at Valley Forge, which in fact was very great. And that was, a, that was about the time that um, Thomas Paine set down those words about how the, sun, the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will desert their cause. If he who stands by his country now deserves his country's respect. And um, I think that's about it. Thank you. Chuck, once again, uh, this is, in my opinion, the best talk that you have ever given at this institution. No question about it. You were to the point, you were generally pretty accurate. Uh, there was very little ideological baggage attached to it. You just stated the facts and did it well. You deserve applause. Now, I've heard, I've heard the uh, allegation that Molly Pitcher could have walked with her apron past the troops and had that apron filled with half crowns. I question it for this reason. The average continental soldier had probably not seen a half crown in eight years. These were men who did not have shoes. They did not have clothing. 
They ate maybe once a day if they were lucky. They didn't need to worry about weight loss plans. They were on the continental diet. And uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, there have been armies throughout history where it could be said that the soldiers were great, it's the leaders that were lousy. That's very typical of the French and it's been very typical of other countries throughout history. Certainly during the American Revolution, the soldiers were magnificent, the politicians in Philadelphia were a disgrace. George Washington wrote, pleaded, came in person, begging for money, for shoes, for medicine, for clothing, and was getting nothing but, you know, the usual political uh, round the round and round again and nothing happens. And yet he continued. He found what he needed, where he could find it, and most importantly, he learned to adapt the fighting methods of the Indians. Be where your enemy least expect you to be. Hit. Go somewhere else where they least expect you to be. Don't worry about losing every battle. As George Washington, I mean, if, if, if we were talking about what his box score was, it was not a good one because he lost more battles than he won. What marked George Washington for victory was the fact that he persevered. He kept at it, and he kept at it, and he kept at it until the French, for their own reasons, came to our aid. And that was largely because they were already fighting Great Britain and Europe, and the British were being worn thin by fighting in India and in Europe and sporadic revolts in Scotland and in Ireland. The British Army was being weakened very, very quickly. That was the time. George Washington knew it. Furthermore, it didn't help that, as Chuck pointed out, George Washington wanted one thing in life. His boyhood dream was to hold the King's Commission in the British Army. He had the skills. He had the motivation. He had everything that any country looking for officers would have jumped at. But because of the fact that the British were at that time operating under a terribly ossified class system, he was not eligible for command. And because he was a colonial who wore a blue uniform instead of a red uniform, uh, he was unworthy of serious consideration. If George Washington had been made a lieutenant in the British Army 30 years earlier, can you imagine how history would have changed? Because most of the record shows, most of the other American generals during the Revolution did not have the stick to it of this. Benedict Arnold, one of our greatest heroes up to a certain point, because of the fact that he was screwed over once too many times, and because of the fact that he kind of fell victim to the brandishments of Peggy Shippen, Peggy Shippen, uh, and we can see from pictures that you know she would be easy to uh, listen to. Uh, you know, <laughs> the fact, the fact of the matter is, George Washington was a man of incredible character. It has less to do. It has less to do with the justice of our cause than it had to do with the fact that here was a man with a will of iron who knew what needed to be done and wasn't afraid to carry on to the last minute. We didn't see that in Vietnam. That's why we lost that war. We were beaten by people using our same tactics. And we paid for it because we didn't pay attention and I've just been <laughs> cut off. <laughs> I wonder what I can add. Uh, my own family, uh, there was a, a Thomas Basford who was, uh, whom I'm a descendant, uh, who was uh, in the Revolutionary Army, and there were a lot of Basfords uh, who left for Canada because they were loyal. <laughs> Uh, there was one bastard who was a British admiral, 
uh, he got fired by the king because he refused to sell the uh, British uh, fleet uh, uh, up the uh, Bronx River, which was on their charts. The Bronx River is uh, it doesn't have the adequate depth to, to carry uh, uh, the British uh, uh, um, men of war and uh, so on. So uh, he refused to do it and got fired. Uh, that's my uh, family uh, re re recollections of that revolution. Uh, uh, Colonel Bassford, uh, Thomas Bassford, uh, 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 did get a pension eventually, I think uh, around 1820 or something, shortly before he died. <laughs> but. Uh, People generally either fought for the king or, or uh, for their country, uh, and the, the two were uh, uh, the two ideas of king or country uh, as, were not separate for the loyalists. Uh, they it was king and country, and uh, for the Americans, it was uh, for uh, a country, and uh, the Americans generally were uh, loyal uh, to their colony uh, more than to the uh, country as a whole. The country as a whole became an entity in their minds uh, after the uh, the Revolutionary War, because in the process of their united struggle uh, and in the uh, follow-up to it, they knew that they had to stand together or die separately, as uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin put it. What else to say? Uh, we can learn that People like ourselves can have an influence on history and on the, the uh, shape of uh, our uh, social relations, and uh, for better or for worse. And uh, if you put your life on the line, your time, your energy, and so on, you may have an effect particularly if you study how. Uh, the uh, meeting that I mentioned of uh, the uh, news and letters people, the uh, Marxist humanists, uh, this uh, coming Monday night, uh, is of a, a group who feel that they have uh, a better <laughs> a better bite on the uh, on the analysis of what makes for uh, a social revolution, the kind of social revolution they're looking for, and uh, uh, the kind of social relations that uh, can succeed uh, in, in making a more human world. Okay, uh, so I think maybe uh, listening to and uh, being involved with the discussion of this Monday night might be a worthwhile endeavor. But, uh, but there's also citizens taking action. Uh, they're meeting Monday night too, right? So uh, you could go uh, to uh, the Methodist Church there, uh, at least their building, uh, and uh, it's on the fourth floor, isn't it, Charlie? Yes. Uh, it's uh, seven o'clock. All right. Hi. Here, Tim. Let's uh, thank Charlie again for a well put together presentation. Here, here. And this. Uh,
you're the best child. Good pictures, too. <laughs> it has been said of recent that America is on its way down, that we're not like our ancestors, that we don't, that we lack the will and determination, and that our country is on a downhill slope. And that a lot of times the last generation was the greatest generation and today's generation is living off its thing, living off of its stuff. The funny thing that surprises me about America is how much we were able to get successful as a country. We had resources and we had things, but there's a lot to be said about our government during that time that uh, allowed us to become successful. One of the greatest inventions after the American Revolution was the formation of the patent office and trademarks. That, that there was a, now a law that you could patent intellectual property and the laws governing corporations and corporate governance, which allowed for a lot bigger enterprises to get together, have a legal standing, and be able to innovate properly. Over the, since the beginning of the Erie Canal, government has been a major part of building infrastructure in the United States. Not just private corporations, there's also been a real catalyst in the formation of education of, of children and other things in this country. And don't forget, even during Lincoln's time, when we had the Civil War, he had the Land College Act and the Homestead Act, which allowed many people to get educated and, and to become land-holding citizens in the United States during that time. So for many people who say that capitalism, including myself, was the major engine that did it, it's still a, a foundational partnership that really drives American innovation and revolution. The other thing that you got to remember too is our laws make it easy to go bankrupt and to start over. In Europe at that time, if you had that happen once, you were done. Now for me, I honestly think we've undergone, in a sense, in the last 20 years, an information revolution, and I believe that our next upcoming trend or revolution is going to be that with energy. He who has the cheapest way to get it on a non-fossil fuel basis, whether it be through renewables or nuclear, is going to be the next successful major trend that we see in the, in the, in the world. And furthermore, I'm firmly convinced that our country has not yet seen its greatest days. We're still in our infancy in a lot of ways with our so-called empire. And like many adolescent boys, our empire is crowned and subject to hiccups. We make mistakes every day and for me I think going into Iraq was one of them and possibly Afghanistan but from what, we, what, what you don't see here is that many of those terrorists use our own revolution against us. They said, look what they look what the Americans did to the British, and now they are the British Empire. We don't treat people who work for us in Iraq like other countries did, for example. When the British had people like their interpreters work for them, they flew them all out one night to get out of the country. We're still in America debating what we should do with a lot of the people who work for us in Iraq when they're uh, being killed by their fellow countrymen for going against the uh, patriots. The relevant point of the matter is, is that we did have a good revolution. We got great. I still think we're somewhat missing the ball with this generation, but we can get it back. What really needs to happen is we need to band together again as a country get our math, our science people back up to stuff and reclaim our greatness by going back to work and, and getting off a lot of these uh, social programs that we're seeing. Free money will never be turned down, but it's going to cost somehow, sometime, somehow. And I'm beginning to ramble, so I'm just going to wrap it up now. Thank you. Charlie, last word. All right. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, boys and girls. Yeah. Now you all have grown in your citizenship. If there's any civic groups, you know. Actually, do you think I'm that unbiased? 
Yeah, I got to work on this one. Uh, let's see. I bet it was a compliment. Dave left, yeah. Dave left, he's talking you on about the Declaration of Independence. Actually, I left out the thing. The Declaration of Independence, at least in my reading, was nothing more than a technicality. They didn't. They said, well, Jefferson, you haven't done much. And he was kind of quiet and younger. And they said, so why don't you write this thing? <laughs> I don't think they paid quite that much of the detail. It was the declaration itself regarding Valley Forge. I guess they lived on something called fire cake. And they would just mix water and flour and heat it on a rock. I don't know. If that's what they were surviving on. Regarding, and that's the all. oh, I left out a story. The, um, did I, did I tell the story about the the German general that was marching through New York? And uh, he saw all these colonial guys with weapons and headed in the other direction. And he thought he was marching away from their main headquarters. And he thought, he, I don't know why he thought this. He thought they were all going to go and sign up for the British Army. <laughs> And he even remarked, oh, it's good, you know, the, the Americans are joining us or something. But now regarding the women, though, and um, Molly Pitcher, there's stories about the, New York, the British Army spent a lot of time on Staten Island. And there's all kinds of accounts about the young women of Staten Island. Which, <laughs> um, when Abigail Adams... Um, went to the court in England, she writes a rather thing that the simple American girl was much more attractive than anything she saw in the court of England. And uh, let's see, in Charleston, there is a diary that's often used or read uh, of a young girl. She was 16 and about her interactions and the, they were under siege and things like that but some British soldiers were flirting with her or something and she had a guitar and they said well how about how about once you play it's a tune so she played a, a rebel song for them <laughs> uh, and regarding your history there you're entirely correct I think I missed a little bit of it uh, the British were fighting a war 3,000 miles away. The quickest you could do it is in six weeks. I'm not a military guy to call it unity of command is lost. And there's certain, now I don't think it was so much communications. I don't think these guys were a little competing with one another. When are we supposed to go here or that? I, could, I think they just said the hell with that guy, you know. I stayed up in a lot. But the difficulty of unity of command, uh, certainly in those distances. Regarding the ocean, the Americans hired something like 449 pirates to make the trip to and from a little difficult and things like that. Anyhow, um, what this has to do with Waco, I don't know, Mike, but <laughs> I, I don't know if... You know, it's true they, anyhow, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so very much, Ted. All right. Why would the British have allowed them to begin? You don't know that story? They had a sea battle. No, I mean, that the French were. You've got an army in Yorktown, and they, you set up a blockade I to start. I can answer the other guys to beat you. I can answer that. Okay. There was a sea battle first called the Battle of the Cape. Yeah, but the point is. And the French defeated the British at yeah. that time. Yeah, but the, as I understand it, the frogs had already set the blockade up, and the Brits tried to break it. Yeah, they won in semi circle. Yeah, but then the, the, the front should have never got there, is the point. But they did. Okay, well. Well, the French, somebody dropped the ball. The French had missed twice before that. The fleet showed up two weeks late. So, um, hurricane season, you know.
they were, you know, the real question is, I think they're more I have a problem uh, bringing Chuck hurricane up there than I can bring Chuck helping up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you, Charlie. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. I, it's been a, a, an interesting and uh, lively.